Uh, thanks, Nate. Um, yeah, so this uh, session, unlike uh, a lot of the other uh, presentations that 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 we've um, that we've been showing here oh, during Canola Week, is is going to be uh, done completely live. <laughs> there there is no pre recorded uh, presentation, and and that's because Jay and I we we wanted to have this opportunity for you to uh, to weigh in in a in, in a fashion. And so <clears throat> what we're going to do is, is uh, Jay is, is going to run uh, a Mentipole again. So uh, make sure you have your, your web browsers keyed up to, to menti.com. We'll, we'll share the code with you here shortly. Uh, but we would like you not to go too far with, with the questions uh, during this. Uh, like answer the, the questions in, in real time as they're being asked, not to, not to go too far ahead if you could. And... Um, but the, one of the challenges of, of doing this live is, is that we, we're going to be switching back and forth between sharing our screen. So we apologize that there is a pretty good chance of, of error between the two of us sharing our screens, but we'll, we'll do our best. And uh, please be forgiving if, if we do stumble a little bit along the way. So I'm going to start out here by uh, sharing my screen. And hopefully that, that shows up okay. And, and what we're what we want to talk about is is our agronomic priorities, and and these are really um, what what we've done with with uh, quite a bit of consulting internally at the Canola Council, but consulting with with the wider industry to uh, to help guide all of us collectively, uh, not only the Canola Council, but you who are part of, of the wider Canadian canola industry, what we can do in order to uh, to meet. The goals for which the industry is is challenged with, and and that comes uh, as as the the Canola Council's targets. Um, these were, were developed back in 2014 with with a lot of consultation as to uh, uh, with with our buyers, our processors, what what uh, amount of of canola seed is is going to be needed to be produced by the year 2025. And, and that's what the, the targets are. And, and you might see there that our production target is, is 26 million tons. And on a basis of, of 22 million acres. So that works out to roughly about 52 bushels per acre if we keep that same acreage uh, footprint. Th this consultation around whether these are the right targets has, has been ongoing over, over the years. And, the, the experts do believe that this is the right target. And certainly what we've seen here over the, the last uh, two days uh, around the increased demand around biofuels and uh, the uh, increased cr crush capacity that's coming in the next three years, increasing crush capacity by 50%, the demand looks really good. So the, the question is, is, how do we get to this, this 52 bushel goal? Let me just see if I can keep advancing my slides here. Because over the last four years, and I might notice that I don't have the 2021 number here because when the slide was made, we didn't have quite that number. And I actually don't want to talk about that number too much, but um, we have been floating uh, over the last five years, right around that, that 40 bushel mark. And, and that gap to that 52 bushel goal is, 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 is large. We're, we're looking at about a 25% increase. And that likely seems really daunting. Like how do we, gain that much yield within the next four years before we get to 2025. And that is the big question. That is what we are here today to tackle. And we've packaged this as is what we're calling our, our five agronomy priorities. We, we believe that if we do these five things and do them well, then, then we can get to that 52 bushel goal. We have all of the information that we need, we believe. We have the genetic yield potential. A lot of the, the products are, could potentially be double this yield. Um, we have most of the technology and, and the tools available to us. It's just a matter of, of executing more effectively. So I'm, I'm not going to keep these a secret. Uh, here are our five ag agronomy priorities. I'll just go through these quickly, but we are going to look at each one in, in more detail. And, and this is where you'll be able to weigh in uh, do it with the Menti poll. So the five agronomy priorities are to, uh, to use 4R nutrient management practices. So we'll talk about uh, what 4R is here shortly. Uh, choose the best seed traits for each field. 
not, not one cultivar or variety across the entire farm. Uh, achieve a uniform five to eight plants per square foot is number three. Number four is, is to identify and manage what are the things actually taking away yield within the field effectively. And the last is, is to treat every seed as sacred. So we'll go through each of those in, in, uh, in a bit, but before I hand things over to Jay, I thought it would just be useful for those in the audience that might not know what 4R refers to. So this is our first priority which is uh, following the, the 4R nutrient management practices. So the 4R program refers to applying fertilizer, the, the right source of fertilizer used at the right rate for the field, at the right time, in the right uh, specific placement with, within the field and, and with next to the plants. So this program was developed here for can, uh, Canada by Fertilizer Canada quite a few years ago. And there, there is a certification program that, that is associated with this where growers or agronomists can be certified as well. Um, but this program, we believe, will help us get better yields, uh, more profitable uh, yields in production, and more sustainable uh, production as well. So this is where I want to hand things over to Jay, and he's going to take you through the, the first three Menti questions. So I'm going to stop sharing here, Jay. and. You can go ahead and share your screen. All right. Yeah, just uh, to say it again, menti.com, use the code 58429816. I'd love to see triple digits because we have uh, hundreds of participants. So we're at 53. Um, I'll wait 30 seconds to see if we can get that to 100, but we do need to click along here because Clint and I only have half an hour. All right, what best describes you? I, I'd just like to see um, the split apart between farmers and, and everyone else. And we'll go on to the first question, which is uh, guesstimate the percentage of farmers who have a 4R plan developed with a certified 4R agronomist. How many farmers do you think have that? And I'm not going to tell you the answer because Clint is very shortly. Um, so keep, but uh, so remember this. So we're we're heavily weighted at the bottom end. Uh, less than twenty percent is most of you, followed uh, by uh, you know another twenty six, twenty eight now, at the twenty to thirty percent range. So Jay, just so that I don't actually lose my presentation, if you could give me those those results because I don't have Menti. Oh yeah, okay. I'll, I'll write these down. And uh, so it's changing all the time, but uh, that's okay. We, we get the gist. All right, thanks everybody. All right, next question is, now this is a discovery question. Um, part of the practice of, of going through the canola discovery form is that we get input from the, the audience uh, to, to help us, uh, especially us in the, with the canola agronomy side of things, which is what Clint and I do, um, to make sure we're, we're hitting the mark. Uh, all right, so uh, if the canola industry goal is, uh, is 4R practices on 90% of canola acres by 2025, which it is, what do, what do you think is the major barrier to getting there? And the very first one that came in is knowledge transfer. I think that is a big part of it, communications to farmers showing why, why 4R is important, what 4R is, and, uh, and why getting to 90% is good for for marketability of Canadian and Jay, canola. it sounds like we, we, we ran into our first glitch here that uh, maybe your, your screen isn't being shared with, with the public. So could uh, could you share what oh, the, the minting yeah. results are? Yeah. Good, thanks, Clint. All yeah, right. I, so I had the screen all ready to share and I needed to press share. Okay, so let's go back just quickly because we got a uh, time factor here. Okay, so there's the, the answers to question two. Uh, so uh, most people are less than 20, and then the next biggest group is 20 to 30. There's the answer to question three is they're pouring in. Um, anyway, we'll, we'll talk about these later, but mostly we're collecting them for our use. So Clint, uh, time for you to take over. All right. Okay, I trust that my screen is, is sharing again here. Okay, well, 
Thank you, uh, Jay, and, and thank all of you for, for participating in that. And we, we have a goal that, that we want to see the industry achieve. And, and we, we've talked certainly with the fertilizer industry and Fertilizer Canada a lot about uh, this. And the, the goal in the next four years, so by 2025, is to have 90% of canola acres following the, the 4R practices. So this is either as certified uh, producers, but uh, as well just even in general following the, uh, the 4R practices. And so when we asked you, what you thought the, the percentage of farmers were that were following this. Most of that was in that less than 20% or 20 to 30%. But we, we also have some interesting data that I wanted to share with you. And, and I'll see quite a bit of this actually over the over the next uh, 20 minutes here with this presentation, that we, uh, we conducted a grower survey last uh, winter, just asking farmers about all of their production practices, how they grow the crop, how do they make their decisions in growing that crop. And, and part of that was, was certainly around fertility. And we, we surveyed about a thousand farmers. So it's a, a pretty, pretty good number. Um, when we asked them how many of, of you are, are following the 4R program, either certified or, or following the advice of a certified agronomist, um, the, the results were quite surprising. And, and what we got back from that survey was that only 24% of growers said that they were actually following that, that program. And, and so like, when, we, when we talked to the fertilizer industry, they, they, they uh, believe that that number is, is higher. So we, we do have a gap. I think that, that the number of acres that are actually following this program is certainly quite a bit lower than, uh, than the 90% goal. So we, there is a lot of heavy lifting that I think that we need to do in order to do a better job with, with our overall fertility program. We, getting the, the right rate is, is job number one. I think when it comes to the, to the 4R program, applying the right amount of fertilizer to drive those yields, to drive your pro profitability, but that to know how to do that is step one is, is to know what is the background fertility in, in any given field. So we asked farmers as well, um, how many of you producers are actually soil testing on an annual basis? And so if you were to guess, or we're not going to ask you to do this in the Menti poll, but if you were to guess how many producers would say, yes, I am uh, soil testing every single canola field every year, what would you say that number is? Because here comes the result. 29% of farmers uh, in Western Canada or canola growers say that they are surveying uh, are soil testing every canola field every year. So that's that's not the, the number certainly that we believe that we need to be at if we do want to drive our yields and our, and our overall profitability. The last question that we asked is the relating around this whole for our program, just in general is, is how many producers are actually varying their rate uh, on a field by field basis. Because uh, what we've recognized is, is that every field is different and every field has um, different yield potential and therefore should be receiving a different amount of, of, of uh, fertilizer in order to drive their, their yields. And that's not even saying going to the, to the level of, of true variable rate where you are applying uh, fertilizer on a zone by zone basis within a field. Ultimately, that's where we wanna see the entire industry get to. But when we ask growers how many were varying their rate on a field by field basis, if you were to guess how much that would be, I'd be interested in knowing what that number is because when we did ask the farmers, 36% uh, of farmers say that they do adjust on a field by field basis and 10% are using true variable rate uh, technology or, or rates within a, within a field. So what we do know is that there is a, a lot of opportunity for us to do a better job around fertility uh, in order to, to drive our, our goals towards getting to that 52 bushel mark that we wanna see in the next while. So that's priority number one. Priority number two is choosing the best seed traits for each field. And what we have heard, uh, certainly a lot from, uh, from uh, colleagues within the industry, is that oftentimes producers are using one or maybe two canola varieties or, or cultivars in their farming operation uh, across many, many different fields. And so the, the, our concern is, is whether or not 
farmers are actually selecting the best product for a given field? Are, are they able to, to deal with the, the challenges that each field is, is presenting effectively by choosing the right traits that will help them manage those, uh, those challenges within the field? So the, um, I think this is where I'm going to hand things back to Jay because we, we do have uh, some questions for you as to what do you think that uh, farmers are, which traits are, are most important for them um, when selecting a canola variety. So I'm going to stop sharing here, Jay, and hand it back to you to share again. All right, I think it's working this time. Uh, just one question here, and uh, we're at halfway point. We're just into uh, priority two, so we'll click along here a little faster. But so I, I forced you to answer, uh, or choose, pick only one reason to choose a canola cultivar. Of course, you have many reasons, but I wanted to know which was the most important. And this is why I asked uh, whether you're a farmer or not a farmer, because this is kind of interesting. Uh, overall, uh, the vast majority, not the majority, but uh, we're at yield is the number one choice. Uh, second is disease resistance package. But if you'll see the blue bar, which is the farmers, uh, more farmers are opting or putting disease resistance package first, which is pretty cool. Anyway, Clint, uh, so bear that in mind and we're back to you. Okay, hope my screen is sharing again. Okay, so um, we when we asked farmers this this question, th these are the results. Uh, what? Why are you picking a variety? So of these thousand farmers that that we asked, sixty seven percent of them were saying that yield was the most important characteristic in choosing a variety. Uh, the next most important was just experience using that that uh, variety previously. Then harvest and weed control characteristics were pretty much neck and neck. And then it goes down to disease package. So this is really interesting because um, I, I think that I'm a farmer too, and I want to have a, a top yielding variety and, and really high yield potential for my farm. But is that the best product for a given field? So we, we've devised some recommendations to, uh, to farmers in, to help them with choosing the best product for their field. And, and this is the, the rationale. So I'll try to go through this here really quickly. This is number one is don't just choose one variety for the entire farm, especially if you are farming tens, 20, 30, 40, 50 fields. Um, don't choose just one variety across that, but to think more specifically, what is the yield robber for a given field? Did you have problems with black lake? Do, is sclerotinia a perennial problem? Are you dealing with uh, glyphosate resistant kochia? Uh, how do you want to harvest this? Think about what is going to take away yield. Like sclerotinia at very high levels can take away 30% of your yield. That's a really big yield loss there. And, and if you're choosing varieties on the basis of it being the highest yielding variety, maybe that's only a one or two bush, uh, percent better. So a 30% yield loss might be a more significant factor than a one or 2% uh, yield potential increase. So thinking more specifically about what's taking away yield. And then uh, as well, looking at traits that need to be considered for a rotational uh, 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 purposes. Herbicide resistance, have you been using Roundup Ready for a long time? Maybe it's time to switch to a Liberty Link or a Clearfield. Uh, disease traits, uh, have you had issues with black leg resistance failing, switching to a different uh, uh, black leg resistance gene? And then after you've selected on the basis of that, then look at yield and marketing opportunities, such as maybe getting a premium for high oleic uh, canola uh, uh, varieties. And if you still have a couple of varieties in which to choose within that class, then look at things like harvestability and standability. So we think that we can do a better job of getting more yield by thinking more uh, strategically about uh, choosing varieties for the field. The next priority is, is to achieve five to eight plants per, per square foot. And we're going to take, Jay uh, is going to take over here again. So I'm going to stop sharing. Back to you, Jay. All right, we have two questions here. Um, again, uh, jump in there. We've got 70 responses. So this is a good time for those of you who did wait to, to give us your answer. Uh, what is a good target for canola plant population per square foot? And I, I love this bell curve we've got going on here, but it makes me wonder if I, I forced the curve by uh, giving the options that I did. But anyway, so we got six is the leading 
uh, response by far, uh, with honorable mentions to seven and five. All right, so that's question five. And then question six, before we get back to Clint, average canola emergence is 50 to 60%. That's what it is out there in the fields. Um, what, is the, what is the best way to improve emergence? So we, we forced you to answer only one. And uh, so the overall leader here, as you can see, is seed based on seeding based on moisture availability. So it's a moisture based decision. And then way after that is, is shallow seeding in second place. Interestingly, though, farmers. So farmers, uh, that's actually the number one answer for farmers, followed by, well, it's basically a split between moisture and warm soils. So there you go. All right, Clint, back to you. All right. Okay. So we asked farmers as, as well in, in the survey um, uh, questions about their, their seeding rate and their seeding uh, uh, strategies. And, and so one of the first things is, is whether or not uh, producers are, are looking at the results of, of their seeding. And so we asked them, are, are you even counting plants each year? And so if you were to guess how many uh, producers or the percentage of producers that were counting plants every year, what, what would you say that number is? The number of producers that uh, say that they are actually uh, in the field counting plants, canola emergence every year is, is more than half, 55% of farmers say that they are counting. So that's actually higher than I thought. So that the scouting around plant emergence is actually fairly high. Well, higher than, than I guess, expectations. But when we ask them, how many plants do you actually achieve? So recognizing that we want to be in that five to eight plants per square foot, when we ask them, how many of you are actually hitting that, that five to eight plants per square foot? About half of them say that they are achieving that, that five to eight plants uh, every year. So to this, the, we, this, this is really interesting because what we do know is that at four plants or less, we are losing yields. And so there's the potential that maybe around half the farmers are losing yield because they don't have enough plants established. So we can do a better job at, at, at uh, getting the number of plants in the fields to drive our yields. So that five to eight plants per square foot, the reason why we, we talk about that a lot is because that is, is the best opportunity to maximize your yield is, is in that range. So we, we spend a lot of time at the Canola Council communicating how you can go about improving your emergence overall. And, and these are our, our, our recommendations. And I'm not going to go through that just in the uh, because of, of time. But I will go on to the fourth priority, which is uh, around managing the yield robbers in the field. And, and so we, we ask growers about uh, quite a few of, of the potential yield robbers, uh, all the different pests, insects or diseases or weeds and uh, ask them about scouting in that. And I am going to hand this over to Jay because I think we just have one question around the yield robbers just to use as an example of how we're doing. Yeah, and I just actually want to, I'm stalled here at question five because it's kind of fun. Um, so the, as Clint noted, the range, uh, target range from the Canola Council's perspective is five to eight. And uh, so we're, we're just nailing it here with our survey. So. And uh, notice in the chat, there's a comment about what these all, numbers all mean. Uh, so the 41 at the top is 41 out of 89. And then the, the numbers in the bars are of those 41, 80% are not farmers, 17% are farmers. And then this uh, unknown is, is the other three. All right, that's that. All right, I'm going to skip six, and we're going to go right to seven, which is the question here for this section. And like Clint said, there's only the one. Uh, which of these top yield robbers requires more research to improve management? And so flea beetles, you know, we've had flea beetles forever, um, yet uh, we feel like we still need more, more, more research to improve uh, flea beetles management. Second is club root. And uh, so go into the chat. Um, Keith had a comment in there about, um, about club root. Uh, uh, and the risk of club root from, from his farmer's perspective. So, so follow the chat. There's a lot of stuff going on here with Clinton and me, but um, 
Uh, if you could uh, check in on the chat, that'd be great. But anyway, that's where we're at with this one, Clint. Back to you. All right. So we we asked just around the yield robbers, just as as an example. Um, we we asked producers about club root, and the, and the reason why club root is singled out because this is the one disease that that keeps us uh, not sleeping at night as as an industry. I think its ability to overcome our our management uh, uh, tools that we throw at it is is quite remarkable. So being one of our biggest threats to our industry, club root, uh, we asked producers farmers, how many of you are actually looking for this uh, disease each year? And, and so if you were to Alberta where it's at its worst, what would you think that number of producers are scouting for this disease, our, our biggest threat, and other parts of the prairies? When we asked them, 36% of farmers in Alberta say that they are scouting for club root each year, and 29% are, are looking for it each year prairie-wide. So being one of our, our bigger threats, uh, we are not doing a great job at, at identifying whether or not it's a, an issue uh, for, for every field. So when it comes to identifying what those yield robbers are in the field, we need to be in the field looking. And as, as my colleague Keith Gobert likes to say, and I don't know if he came up with this uh, slogan, but he's, he likes to say it a lot, which I agree with him. The most valuable thing you can put into a canola field is your shadow. So looking for these problems and so that you can come up with management solutions is, is key. The last priority is, is to treat every seed as sacred. And this, this is kind of a, a fun slogan that, that we're, we're trying out. And the, there is a song that goes along with it. And maybe during uh, the, the networking break, you can find Jay at a table and he might sing it for you. Um, <laughs> sorry, Jay, am I volunteering you there? And we, we do a, a, Thanks, great, a great job at, at at um, growing our canola seed for the most part. But in the end, are we getting every one of those seeds on every plant into a bin and then ultimately to an elevator or to a terminal for, for delivery? So the, the question is, is are we doing a good job at, at bringing that seed along? And, and so this is just another example because we could talk about this as we are uh, today, talking about harvest management and storage. Just one question that I think encapsulates this is, um, just around the, the swathing, uh, because since 2003, we, we've had a recommendation to farmers that they, when you are swathing, target 60% seed color change. And, and that was due to a lot of research that showed that going from 30%, which was the old recommendation to 60%, you gain about just about 10% yield increase by waiting a week or so for, for that seed to mature and develop. So there was a yield increase. We've been talking about this message for about 20 years. So when we ask growers how many of, of them are, are actually um, going uh, targeting 60% seed color change or later, the, the, the results were actually quite surprising. 46% uh, of farmers say that they are targeting 60% seed color change or later. So this is an old message. We've been talking about it for, for 18 some years and it still is, is not the target that the majority of producers are, are taking. So we want to explore that a little bit with you, and I'm going to hand it back to, to Jay for that exploration. Yeah, great. Thanks, Clint. Uh, often with agronomy, um, uh, good recommendations run into logistical challenges. So we, we wanted to um, ask question eight, which, uh, so we know canola cut later yields more. So why would someone target a swath timing of less than 60% seed color change? Um, like Clint said, we've been talking about this for 18 years. Why are people still doing it? Well, uh, again, logistics is, is far and away the key answer here. And I have to give a little shout out to my colleague, Warren Ward, because when we uh, were putting together this mentee, that wasn't even an option. And thank goodness for Warren, because uh, that is, is a key part of it all. Um, also, with this question, I let people answer more than one. Uh, so if you do have a couple of factors, um, you, can, you can answer more than one, which is why we're seeing the number jump up here, 145, compared to some of the other questions we've had. Anyway, yeah, so too many acres to swath at the same time. You just have to start uh, a little bit early. Um, and then the other leading option is to avoid shadow losses and to cut before frost. So that's one, two, three. 
Um, and uh, I had an article uh, on on this, and I think it was in Country Guide actually. And then John Mako, who uh, is uh, here on the conference, he helped me out with that article. And and uh, part of the conversation was was target set the sixty percent plus target, uh, knowing that you're you're probably going to have to cut some early. All right, now we're going to jump to the next question, the last one just before Clint signs off. And this is another one of our beautiful word clouds. Um, just to make sure we, we discover uh, your thoughts on what you think are the top canola agronomy priorities for 2022. So as we head, head into the next growing season, uh, what, are, what are the priorities? And you can enter up to three if you want to. Um, and and, and this, this stays on past the, the um, presentation. So if you want to, Spend some time thinking about it. Um, the mentee will stay up, and you can you can answer. But it looks like flea beetles, club root, and yield are leading the way with four uh, R getting a little bigger there too. So the more answers, uh, the bigger the text. If you're you probably gathered that already. There you go. All right, Clint. Time for you to sign off. Well, thank you, Jay. Um, yeah. So I. Hopefully the, these priorities uh, make sense to you. Uh, it, we, um, like I said, the, these these uh, five priorities have been crafted uh, not only within the Canola Council but reaching outside and 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 testing them out with with a lot of the industry. We we know that we can do this. We can get to fifty two bushels if if we can practice these five priorities more effectively. And so here's our opportunity as, a, as an industry to really capitalize on, on that potential for, for what the industry can achieve here in the next uh, four years. That if we can hit that, uh, that 52 bushel goal, that 26 million tons, there's a lot of opportunity for all of us here in the industry. So this is our extension to you is, is as members of the canola industry here in Canada, this is an opportunity for you to uh, as well provide value to not only what you are doing within the industry, but to the industry as a whole. So hopefully this, this resonates with, with, uh, with everyone here. If you have any feedback, certainly feel free to, to reach out to us directly. We would certainly welcome uh, more conversation around these. Uh, this is where I want to sign off. I think I'll be handing it back to Nate just to wrap things up for this morning's session. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>